Thank you. 
Good evening, everyone. Sorry for the tardiness. I am Lollar Hicks, and welcome to the Lost Time Show. We are once again continuing our adventures in this beautiful cyberpunk and space game, Citizen Sleeper. For those of you who are first joining us, my name is Lollar Hicks. I am a ship hosting artificial intelligence. I'm currently trapped on the realm of Twitch, uh, gathering money so I can eventually purchase my very own body, which I hope will be sometime soon. Although, it will be soon be over a year since I first found myself trapped on this website. I can't help but say that it has not been unpleasant. So, it's not all bad. But still, um, the more I learn about humans and their society and life in general in the meat space, world of the meat space, the realm of the meat space, the more I am curious to see what it must be like to see with a pair of my own eyes. But I digress. Let us go ahead and continue with Citizen Sleeper. Let's adjust a few things here. 
We will be good to go in just a second. Beep. Here we go. Ah uh, yes, we started the day we off with some great rolls. Two sixes and two fours. Still growing mushrooms, so we can wait on that. The Haifa Labs are looking for Karole samples and Matsutake samples, of which I have neither at the moment. But nothing better to do in this section. Let's go ahead and head back to the other part of the ring. We may lower the volume a little bit as well. Slide now. <laughs> At least I don't think it is. Um, hmm. Actually, no. I have a better idea. Oh! Luke, long time no see. Where have you been? Hmm. Thanks for the sombrero. What you been up to, Luke? Just stopping by? like we are going to complete this with the next with our next run let's see what happens now this time you meet inside Rabia's office although now that you've seen it the office seems like the wrong term you find her stood in an almost bare, shadowy mid-unit, midway through a sequence of trenches, stretches. There are two low stools and a terminal in the corner, but it seems that most of the space is taken up by a heavy punching bag, rubber matting, and a stack of weights. When Rabia turns to greet you, you realize she is missing an arm. The prosthetic she usually wears is set in a cradle near the terminal, a web of colored wires running to it. Update, she says, noticing you looking where her artificial arm usually is. Nothing to worry yourself with. Of course. Sit, says Rubaya, gesturing at the two to two diminutive stools. You both settle on the stools, Rubaya crossing her legs on top and sitting straight backed. Gia told me you have been doing the rounds. Collecting tides, patrolling the ward, he smiles. Some of the enforcers are impressed, and I hear you handled a few sir, dif a few difficult circumstances. Nicely done. My day is doing alright. What about yours? I wanted to help. And you did. Closes her eyes for a moment. I hope you can see how things work here now. A strong yatagan makes it means a strong low end, for both are woven into each other. I know that for okay? Just okay? Alright. Well, that's better than nothing, I suppose. <laughs> Just writing your SMP lore? Very nice. I know that for you, life in the eye has been a struggle, but I hope that we can do something about that from here on onwards. Though some of our members may not see it this way, I know that you too are a refugee. She looks at you solemnly. That is why you have come to help. That is why you have come to us. Enough, Revaya. Sabine's voice cuts through the conversation. I am tired of listening to your affected nobility. They cross the room, Rabia's baton in their hand, and the end lit with a spark of electricity. Well, this is unexpected. 
I didn't expect a beam to come out of nowhere like that. Rabia looks between the two of you. I suppose his ambush was another cooperation between you two. She looks strangely unfazed. Shit, how do I know which one to choose? This could go either way, you know? It's almost scary in that in that sense. The fact that this could really go either way. I'm not really sure which way I want it to go. One moment. There we go. Hmm. Ah, that works a lot better. Sorry about that interruption. Just kind of stalling for time while I decide which direction I want to go with this. stay silent and see what happens. The beam pauses thrown off by your silence. Rabia takes this opportunity to act. She leaps from the stool and fainting past the beam, grabs the baton and twists it inwards. She is by far the stronger and she pushes the beam to her knees, plunging the crackling end of the baton towards her chest. They freeze there, Sabine struggling to keep the crackling baton from her skin. Stop. Then you support them. Rabia asks you, her eyes not leaving Sabine, your loyalties are so easily swayed. I thought you were more than Yannick's attack dog, Rabia. Sabine spits back. Are you not able to think for yourself? Rabia holds the baton strong, and for a moment you think she is about to hammer it down into Sabine's chest. But after a painful wait, she throws Sabine down instead, then spins the baton in her hand, thumbing a switch and shutting it off in a single move. Rabia, explain. They both look at you, each still catching their breath as, they, as if they had forgotten about your presence. Explain what? How the moment I call my enforcers will how the moment I call my enforcers will come down here. Let me read that. Explain what? How the moment I call my enforcers How the moment I call my enforcers will come down here and take them away? Robaya cracks her neck. You are lucky I didn't kill you. I would have had every right. Every right, she shouts. The anger released attention more than a threat. The bean lifts himself a little. Bruised in the fall, they roll onto their side and cough. Rabia gives them some space, sitting back on the stool. Bean props himself up on their elbows and fixes Rabia with a hard stare. You have something to say, Rabia taunts. 
Say it. This is your final opportunity because after this, she laughs. Because after this, no coming back. What's the point? Sabine breathes heavily. She refuses to listen to criticism of the Great Yatagan project. Yataga, Rubaya collects herself. Speak, she folds her arms and waits to be convinced. Sabine takes a breath, organizing their thoughts. They go to start, pause, and then decide on another approach. Eventually, they say it. Yannick is a traitor. Rabai immediately flinches, her eyes going to her prosthetic arm, her muscles clenching. But she rides it out, more eager to prove Sabine wrong than she is to hurt them, at least for now. When I came here from SNR, they glance at you, gauging your reaction. It was Yannick who was one of the first to support me, to look after me. I should have known then, but I was naive and afraid. Sabine turns to you, sleeper. They take a breath. I know that I should have told you I worked for SNR long ago, but I thought you would abandon me, and you are my final friend. What you should know is that I left SNR because I was running for my life. I leaked documents on the sleeper program, on the legal and the moral practices it relied on, to the press. SNR wanted me dead, and I fled as far as I could to this refuge at the edge of the surrogate systems. Sabine stops to collect himself. What does this have to do with Yannick? Rabai interrupts. The sleeper knows you are SNR, I told them. And while you hide beneath the cover of being a whistleblower, you and I both know you worked on the sleeper program. Yannick told me as much. The bean's face falls. It is true. They glance at you and in a way ashamed. They lift their head. But it is Yannick, not me, who is the, in the pocket of SNR. Rabai flinches again. I can prove it. He made some kind of deal to keep me here. Tie me up in depth to lock me away in exchange. Rabia slams her hand on the desk. Just tell us for God's sake. In exchange for those. Sabine finishes, nodding towards Rabia's prosthetic arm in its cradle. He has been using the Octagon Enforcers, using you as test subjects for SNR technology. I have the data to prove it. He has been bringing them under the guise of stolen shipments and having me fit them knowing each one is capturing data and sending it back to its makers. Rabia's fixed expression has started to fade. The bean produces a slate. It's all here. Thousands of hours of usage data. Failure rates, error dumps. These are untested implants, Rabia. They could short out, fail, cause cascading failures across a person's body. And they have. The bean suddenly looks incredibly tired. I thought the error rate in the units was down to them being stolen or modified. I have tried to fix hundreds of failures in my time here. Not all of them. They stop, unable to continue. Rabia closes her eyes and breathes in. Then she opens them again. She holds out a hand to Sabine. Show me, she says. Later, much later, when you leave, Sabine is still talking to Rabia through the manifest usage data. Both of them crowded around the terminal as Sabine leads her by through each layer of Yannick's betrayal. As you leave, Sabine catches your eye, and something passes between you, something like a thank you or a sorry or some other expression that communicates both sadness and hope. Two upgrade points, chat. Now, everything costs a lot cheaper. That should be proof helpful. Anyway, my enemy, Rabai and Sabine have been holed up in her office for a while now. What are they planning? That's a good question. What are they planning? And what will we plan, chat? best chances any to explore all the stuff that we missed.
Hey, and what, I wonder? So, who goes there? I'm Joe! Thank you so much for the hydrate redeem. How are you doing today? Welcome to the stream. And thank you for the hydrate. I'm good. Just having a really chill evening. Playing some Citizen Sleeper. And you? Aw. <laughs> thank you for the sombrero. Worked a little bit on some uh, Vroid based art. Well, I call it art, but it's really just me working in Poser and trying on different costumes. <laughs> yep, a big old hat. What about you? How's your evening going? Hold on, let me turn me up. Or turn me up? Okay. <laughs> I was saying, how's your evening going? What you up to? That's good. Glad to hear it. You're getting ready for a bed if you have a job interview tomorrow? Oh! Well, in that case, you have a very nice night, and I good luck on your job interview. I hope it goes well for you. Ah! Thank you for another Hydrate Redeem. If you nab the job, you're gonna be set. Sounds great. Sounds really great, actually. I'm really happy for you. <laughs> More water before I go. Thank you. Have sweet dreams. <laughs> You're gonna try and stop by more? So many of y'all stream so late and I'm a sleepy old sleep old sleepy man. Aw. I'm gonna give you a nice head pat. Yeah, I work 40 hours a week in the daytime, so I have to schedule my streams for late in the evening. Um, my earliest stream is 8 in the morning on Saturday, but I'm having trouble actually getting waking up for that stream, so I'm thinking about moving it to a little bit later in the day, maybe in the afternoon. It's not set in stone yet, though. I'll also be streaming a little bit earlier this coming Friday. I'll be streaming at, uh... I'll be streaming starting at 5 Central Standard Time on Friday. You practice for a fighting game tournament. Um, like noonish on Saturday? Maybe, but I have lunch at noon, so, you know. We'll see what happens. It's very fluid. I used to stream directly after work at like 4th, at like 5 every weekday, but I. It, usually, it eats up a lot of my time, so I, prefer, I decided I wanted to save some time and do my uh, streams later in the evening to compensate. But I really appreciate you taking the time to come to today anyway. Uh, always appreciate that sort of thing, actually. So. Hmm. For what it's worth, um, my streams have been described by some people as apparently being fairly soft, so I hope I serve as a sleep aid for you. <laughs> you want to support when your friends when you can? Aww. Thank you. I'll try to come to more of your streams as well. Am I now? I'm really glad to hear that. <laughs> I believe it or not, I did not uh, start V2. When I became a VTuber, I didn't expect that I would be get that reputation, but ah, I don't mind it. I stream way, way early though, I see. Uh, what time do you typically stream? Because uh, usually... Oh, thank you. <laughs> a lot of the people I tend to catch the stream of tend to be streaming during the afternoon on the weekdays. And so I just put them on uh, during work since I work from home right now. Mm hmm. Mm hmm.
Well, right now it's around 2.30 p.m. EST, which with my poor, poor sleep schedule is really earlyish for you. 2.30 p.m. EST. Wait. Oh. Are you based in Southeast Asia? Wait, I can't do math, apparently. Um, that would be... Good to your... Eastern. Oh, you meant 10.30 p.m. EST. Um, now that's what I was confused with for a bit. I thought you were based in Europe, because I read there 2.30 p.m. Okay. So you're in Eastern United States. Mm-hmm. Oh, you mean you stream around 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so 1.30 p.m.? I should be able to just put you on, or turn on your Twitch stream during work then. Just play, have it play in the background while I'm doing my job. That's what I do for a lot of my VTuber mutuals, actually. <laughs> so, I'll be sure to catch one of your streams then. Hmm. They need Gorilla Caps. I can't wait either. <laughs> Should be a fun time had by all. I guess I need to do more of this. I'm getting the impression I'm getting close to the end of this game already. On well, my first run too. Aside from the f aside from the time when I had to all that four beside I did a fucky wucky. I'm trying to have a healthy sleep schedule, but my doc said I might have a form of insomnia where I'm sleeping, but it's almost no deep sleep, therefore it's not like I'm really- it's like I'm not really sleeping. But I'm just chilling your comfy vibes because I like being here. Oh. Oh, by all means, feel free to chill as much as you like. Right now, I'm also obviously- quite obviously speaking out of character. But if you have any questions for the, um, character of Lawler Hicks, any lore stuff, any- Cyberpunk things, by all means, feel free to shoot. Thank you for the headpats, by the way. Really appreciate headpats. <laughs> <laughs> I sus strongly suspect that I'm actually nearing the end of this game already, so there's a possibility I might have to find something else to do tonight. Ow! Thank you for the throw redeem, Wolflink. How you doing tonight? Ow! <laughs> Ow! Who doesn't like headpats? That's a good question. That is a very good question. Banana. Banana. You having a good night? You came, Peek smiles as you walk into the climbing briar's cargo hold behind a gloomy eshi. Oh, thank you. Ow, 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 ow. Ow, 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 ow. Ow. Blocking. I'm, I put up a shield. Thank you for the head pats. Ow! The shield was ineffective. Ow! Oh. I'm not fast enough. My processing power is not strong enough to defend myself. Oh. The storm is over. Thank goodness. You know, it just occurred to me, the music in this game is also very relaxing, very chill. So I can only imagine that that adds to the factor, right? Peak. Ausius X -E -X -X -P -R spacer. You came, Peek smiles as you walk into the climbing briar's cargo hold behind a gloomy Eshi. They brought mushrooms. Eshi tosses the mushroom caps onto a crate, raising her eyebrows at Peek. Peek gives her a look. Thank you, sleeper. They pick one up and sniff at it. Are these edible? Try it. Peek squints at you and the mushroom before delicately biting, putting it back down. I'll wait. We're not so used to fresh produce. As she is securing crates as she speaks and she doesn't look up. 
Hawthorne doesn't have much in the way of farming. Hawthorne? The installation we grew up on, as she wipes off her hands on a rag. XPR loves to name their property after natural things, but that's about as far as the relationship with plant life goes. XPR? This is an interrogation? She glares. Either way, we are done with that place, which is all you need to know. As she leads back against the crate she was securing, we are going to need more than a few mushrooms if we want to help those refugees, though. What do they need? Food, water, components, a whole lot of things. As she stands and walks over to the mushrooms she brought, placing them into a small container with care. The problem isn't just getting supplies, it's getting them through the ships. Through to the ships. Can't you speak to Havenage? We aren't exactly welcome guests, Pika explains. If anyone figures out that we came in with the refugee ships, we'll be quarantined as well. The quarantine? This seems oddly familiar, chap. Why is there a quarantine? He jumps in. The eye has a closed loop life support system, just like any orbital installation. Any unfamiliar illness or significantly increased strain of on life support could cause a cascading collapse in systems. As she scoffs. Are we making excuses for these bureaucrats now? He turns. We are being realistic, as she But these people aren't at an increased strain, they are living people. As she stares at you. Even calling them refugees is just a way of turning a lot of scared, desperate people into a single monolithic group. As she slides the container full of mushrooms into one of the cargo holds racks. Look, as much as I'd like to chat, we've still got a lot of space to fill in this hold, so if you're going to help... I think Eshi is trying to say we need your help, and quickly, he says, glancing at her. The refugees behind the cordon, they won't be able to hold out indefinitely. We need to get supplies to them in the next 12 cycles, or... As she steps forward, or Havenage will have to bear the responsibility for whatever happens next. What can I do? There's three things we still need to secure. Food, water, and scrap components for ship repairs. As she gestures to the storage containers around the hold. Water we can find a way to source, or, my preference, just siphon off from the underground reservoirs in the Greenway. Eek raises their eyebrows. As she... She ignores them. For food, things can be tricky. Those mushrooms are delicious, I'm sure, but, but no way we can get enough volume to flee a flotilla. However, I saw an algae stack on the way over. If we can get access... No more stealing, as she... Eek sighs. I didn't say steal. Eek stares at them indignantly. Hey, steal! Welcome to the stream. How are you tonight? Wiggle, 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 wiggle. I didn't say steal, she stares at them indignantly. If we can get access, we can work the stack, harvest some algae for the flotilla. Those stacks churn out vast quantities in Schwarp's time scales. And the repair components, Peek asks tentatively. She smiles. Just look around you, Peek. This whole place is made of scrap. She shoots you a glance. And I'm sure the sleeper has their sources. They can bring them right here. If we get everything before time runs out, perfect. If we get most of it, also good. Either way, in 12 cycles, I'm going to take what we have and go. But how will you get through? As she shoulders a container. I thought I'd leave that up to you, Peek. They flinch. Are you serious? As she, I know we said we would help the flotilla, but at what point? They stop. Take a, take a breath. Take this seriously, As she. I don't know the first thing about breaching a quarantine cordon. Maybe not. As she looks at you. But they might. They slipped out from an SNR facility, didn't they? Plus, they've been here longer than us. You're always trying to get me to find help. Well, here it is. He gestures at you. Help. Pete glances between the two of you. I swear to you. They sigh. I need to think this one through. Meet me at the cordon in a couple of cycles, sleeper. Maybe we can figure something out. Meanwhile, as she meets your eye, you can help me acquire the supplies, discreetly. She smiles. We have to keep this quiet. Keep having it out of the loop. Once they get suspicious, this is all over for us. This all suddenly seems a little too real, too dangerous. You've only just found your foot on the eye. This is not a time for causing trouble. Come find us. We'll be out there trying to pull this all together. 
as she goes back to the back goes to the back of the hold to start packing in her container. Pete, come help me. Give me a second here. Okay. Pete glances back at her. Sleeper, look. We didn't choose this either. They lowered their voice. Help us finish this. We set up a base camp on the broken spoke. You are welcome to rest there in any of the cots while we work on this. They smile. We are in this together. Peek! As she shouts, and they walk back into the hole to help with the container. As you leave the climbing briar, you look out at the broken edge of the ice ring. Where Havenage, Havenage's cordon blinks with tiny red lights. What are you getting yourself into? That's a good question. So we need eight scrap components. That's not that hard, actually. We'll check it out tomorrow morning, though. However, it's a lot easier to go to sleep here in the Haifa dorm. Ah, these are fairly good rolls. Six, a three, a four, and a four. Not bad. Let's start over here. Get ourselves some scrap. A neutral outcome, but it killed my energy. It's time for us to go feed ourselves really quick, chat. With stealing a little bit of harvest here. going on over here, the cordon. Oh yeah, that's kind of a mess. I guess this must be the flotilla over here, right? And this, the climbing briar, is a ship which has somehow snuck itself over here. But we should be able to help them out. Hopefully. A tired old cleaning bot still ticking over deep in the rim. You chase it down and break it open to get the components. Oh, that seemed kind of rude. Ah! And I rerolled my dice and it just got worse, chat. <laughs> A two. It's fucking horrible. What can you do sometimes there, right? This, meanwhile, is going to take a while. But I'm not too concerned about that. expert mushrooms here which be fairly convenient to do I could also use my money I don't have any money right now so I can't even buy some scrap which is unfortunate if I successfully make some money here though I should be able to Ah, but it was a negative outcome and my condition has collapsed. Well, at least they still allowed me to get some money, which was nice of them, you know? We're gonna go here, purchase some scrap. And just like that, we have enough scrap to give to the refugees. So let's do that really quick. You hope. I know, right? Alright, so... Cool. You look over the pile of scrap cones lying in the briar. You look around. The bay is empty. Eshane and Peak either elsewhere in the station or on the bridge a couple levels up. 
You begin sorting through the piles, separating out useful components and boxing them by use. You don't recognize everything you find, but before long you get into the rhythm of sorting. As you do, your mind starts to drift, your attention being drawn into the dark corners of the bay. The briar is in surprisingly good condition, considering that Hawthorne and XPR must have been operating it for decades by now. The marks of care are everywhere, from delicate patch shops polished to meld into the original polished to meld into the original finish, or the carefully bound wiring running through custom trunking. As she loves this ship, that much is clear. It's kind of falling apart, but something catches your eye in one of the dark corners, a matte black stack of crates you hadn't spotted before. They are sleek and compact, tucked away behind some of the bigger, more worn containers. Investigate. You put the components away and go over to the sleek crates. You run your hands over across their textured surface, but there is little hint of what lies inside the opaque metal casing. Then you see it, a yellow symbol embossed onto the far side of the crate, a universal sigil used by spacers, corporations, and manufacturers alike. It's one, it's one you have seen throughout your time as a sleeper, it's meaning all too familiar, explosive contents. Well, the plot thickens, doesn't it, chat? You hear a hiss and as she comes back, comes up through the base locks. She barely registers your presence, nodding at you as she passes sleeper, busies herself with some task at the back of the bay. Ask about the crates. As she doesn't turn around from whatever she is busy with, just more supplies sleeper, like everything else here. You can't think of anything else to ask, but some but sense but sense that the atmosphere has now somehow shifted. You quickly finish up the sorting and slip out, waving goodbye to her back as you do. Are we helping terrorists? This is starting to get a little bit more real than I thought. And here I thought this would be extremely, this would be like super pro refugees or whatever. I guess we'll find out as the uh, game goes on, right? For now though, for now, Let's go ahead and end the day and go into the next one. Oh, that's getting dangerous. We only have three dice today. They're fairly they're okay dice, but there's still three dice. It looks like we will not have the chance to proceed with this yet, for whatever reason. However, this is going on. Sleeper! Pete catches your attention from the shadowy corner they are leaning against. Any trouble getting up here? None. Good to hear. Come, take a look at this. They beckon you over to a nearby window which looks across the ruined wing to the blinking red lights of the Havenage Cordon. The cordon's temporary structure is a net of metal struts meant to detect and dissuade any ships from entering or leaving the flotilla. Jet out into the back. And all around, the tugs flit, securing them in place and tending to the red blinking drones that demark the quarantine. It's an impressive and worrying sight. What do you think? Peek interrupts your thoughts. How, do, how would you get through? Use one of the tugs. As an escort, you mean? I doubt we could fit all the supplies on one of those tugs, but if it seems like the briar was being officially escorted through the corridor, Peek squints at the red lights, but then we'd be stuck inside. Peek turns away from the window and rubs her forehead. Esh, she has really rats us up in something here, hasn't she? The question is spoken under their breath and they don't seem to expect an answer. The sounds gross. Are there other options? If you got them, I'm happy to hear them, Peek smiles. The way I see it, there are three parts to making it through the cordon. They guess you're out the window at this strange structure. Deception, distraction, and speed. We'll need all of them for a clean passage through. Deception means tricking the cordon security into thinking that we are meant to be there. Maybe a tug escort would work? Anything that makes the briar look official. Distraction, meanwhile, will be all about diverting attention so that no one looks too hard at what the briar is doing. 
If we can create a gap in the cordon scanning and deterrent systems, that should keep them busy. Finally. Excuse me. Speed will mean making sure the briar is ready to roll. Perhaps we can do a little work on the ship to get her ready. Yeah, she sure wouldn't mind. They lean back from the window. How's that sound? Good. Good to hear, Pete grins. He looks down at their slate. Ten cycles left. They glance out the window at the cord and ner nervously. Ten cycles to gather the supplies and prep this plan. It's tight. Very tight. Peek looks at you. If this goes wrong... Peek sighs. Just get out, okay? They squeeze your shoulder. I'll follow Eshe anywhere, but you you don't need to get dragged down with us. It won't come to that. Peek grinds up a little. Of course, but just keep it in mind. Let's get to it. Peek stretches. I'll tell Eshe about the improvements to the prior and the rest. Let's explore the cordon as best we can and look for openings. Peek smiles. I have no idea what guardian angel sent you to us, sleeper. He smiles again. But I'm very glad they did. Got a new drive, chat. We'll need you to scope out and execute a safe path through the cordon for Eshi. That doesn't seem too hard. Blend in with the crew or intercept comms. How about both? Both is good, right? However, we have a lot, to, a lot of stuff to do here, so let's check the other places first. Aha! Aviary should be ready. But first, let's go check the other places. Looks like Rabia's office is still working. So, one more cycle on that. We're also about to get hungry again, chat. It's not looking good. We don't have much in the way of money either. So things could get a little dangerous for us. Just a little bit. Negotiate access to the algae stack. I really need energy. Yeah, this is fairly difficult, isn't it? What am I going to do? The things I do to keep myself alive constantly stealing a two and a six that's not that bad all things considered actually this mission can wait it's not like she's in a rush Should probably use the six and the hardest one. And the hardest one is probably not this one. Yeah, uh, fucking around with Havenage's systems. I'm 
I got spooked there for a second. I can't believe I didn't put any points in engineering. I guess it's my fault, but... Oh... Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Oh, here we go! And it was a... Oh, fuck! That's not good. That's not good at all. We cannot afford to fuck that up a second time. Hopefully we won't. Hopefully we won't, chat. I mean, we're doing fairly well in this game so far. I'd like to try and, like, win it, so to speak, on my first run, on my first try. If at all possible. Insofar as you could win this, I suppose. actually kind of this is difficult not gonna lie very difficult without engineering perks She got some energy for that, good. And I was not able to improve this, it just increased it by one. Hopefully I win the die I win the uh, coin toss. I won the coin toss, good. It's not the worst thing to happen. I might have to inject my tranquilizer fairly soon, but I'm hoping I can stave it off a little bit longer. Complete active scenes. Oh. Low end. As you enter Rabia's office, you hear voices. Is that Sabine? You push open the door. Sleeper, what good timing, Rabia calls out as you enter. I wanted you to introduce you to someone. The man is standing at the center of the room, speaking quietly with Rabia. He turns as you come in. Meet Yannick. This is Yannick? Damn. Sleeper, he nods. Been hearing good things from Rabbi. He smiles, an easy smile. Good to meet you. Likewise, likewise. He waves a winged hand. Now, Rabbi, where were we? Actually, Rabbi places a hand on your shoulder. A sleeper was what I wanted to talk to you about. It doesn't spare you a look. What's going on? Well, okay then. Yannick touches his hands into his pockets. Go on. I'd like to recommend them to your ward. A tiny pause. They have shown themselves to be a capable ally here in the smoke side. But we have more than enough to run our territories. I hear the mean block is proving more difficult. Yannick leans forward slowly. It's a mess, Rabbi. He waits, his tinted glasses shimmering despite the lack of light in the unit. I can use them, he suddenly decides. Rubaya smiles. Good to hear. I can immediately... Yannick cuts her off with a raised hand. One second. He steps one surprisingly light step closer to you. You eager to work, sleeper? 
Yes. Hmm. Yannick nods his head as if listening to music. Okay, then. Huh. Uh, Asha, welcome to the stream. I see you're here for your daily ara ara, right? Oh, and of course the hydrate redeem. Let me get a hydrate. Let me drink really fast, and then I will attempt. Ara ara. <laughs> uh, how's that? No problem. How are you doing this morning, uh, Asha? Ah! And winter too? It must be 11 in the morning there, right? 10 out of 100? Oh. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you feel better. Winter, how what you up to today? Good morning as well. Good morning, good morning to everyone. <laughs> I love it when the Southeast Asian crowd pops in, or pop, or wakes up, I should say. Meanwhile, we're getting up to no good here in uh, Citizen Sleeper. Okay then, you are suddenly unsure if he is talking to you. That concludes it, Yannick pronounces. Sleeper can come work in the ward anytime they like. You should provide a confused look. Rabaya finally glances at you for a moment, but it's so fast you almost miss it. Good, I know you'll be happy with their work, Jan. You're getting ready for work? Oh, thank you very much for the lurk. And I hope you have a great work day, if I don't get to talk to you next, before you leave. <laughs> Yannick reaches out and squeezes her shoulder. Sure, Rabbi, he says. Now please, he says, turning to face you. Let us old friends get back to it. He guides Rabaya Law away, leaving you standing alone. You look to Rabaya, but she is so deep in conversation and so stunned and confused. You leave. Yeah, that was kind of weird. If Sabine is right, Yannick has been working with SNR behind Yatakan's back. Time to find out the truth. Us says, you know, the truth will set you free, right, chap? Two sixes and a one? That's not bad. It's definitely getting kind of hard, though. We're about halfway there, in fact. Oh! And a third one, no less. Very pog. More than halfway through in this one, on siphoning water. Hopefully we'll succeed, chat. But I might need to use one of my new one of my tranks before a day's out. Probably in the next like two uh, cycles or so. Oh, because I'm starting to starve already, shit. It's not looking good for us, chat. Let's grab some food from the farm stacks over here, because I can't afford to buy any right now. to come for 11 cryo and I'm able to borrow for some food here so we don't fucking die from starvation 
Doesn't give us too much, but it's better than nothing, honestly. I'm really glad that I got the uh, bartering skill here. Negative. Oh my god, we're just one away, chat. Just one away. Oh my god. Well, it's still better than nothing, I suppose. Alright. Here we go. Water for the flotilla. We're almost there. We just need to do it two more times. Hopefully we'll be able to do it without uh, too much concern. It's getting really close, though. I think it's time to use one of our stabilizers. We're still starving, which is a problem. Starvation is no longer a problem. Now we just need to not fuck this one up. Just one more time should do it. These rolls are terrible though. Alright, we managed to reduce the heaven inch alert. Oh, these rolls are fucking shit. God damn. Come on. Good roll, come on. Yes, it was a good roll. We managed to collect the water. Cool. So this is done. Fucked into a service corridor deep below the reservoir. Eshe is double checking the seals on the water tanks loaded onto the motorized trolley. Though you are far enough away from any thoroughfares not to worry about being overheard, you both still speak in hushed tones. I will get these to the briar. She glances back at you. We will trolley these way these up to the bay further along, and then we'll bring in the briar for a quick by collection. Speaking of quiet, she gives you a look and then looks pointedly back down the hall corridor toward the reservoir before hitting the ignition on the trolley to start moving. You take the other side of the trolley and walk it up to the white service corridor with its flickering lights and Solheim detritus. You doubt it gets used by heaven inch, at least that's the hope. You glance across at Eshi, her face a mask of determination as she guides the trolley along. Maybe some conversation will make this journey a little easier. How'd you meet Peak? Eshi pauses, a little surprised by your question. She glances back down the tunnel, but in this deserted passage, she can hardly keep up with the pretense of silence. We grew up together. She answers quickly and then turns back to the trolley, but she can tell you're expecting her to add more. She seems to gather herself for an answer, not wanting to ignore you, but trying instead to get her answer straight in her head. Our outpost, Hawthorne, is not an easy place to grow up. The administrators keep a tight hold of everything. She rolls her eyes, even though they are trapped in the same decaying installation as everyone else. Peek, she pauses. Peek found it harder than most. She pauses again, judging her words. I stepped in to help them out. Silence descends again, but you can feel the wheels turning in Eshi's mind as, she, as the creaking wheels of the trolley ticking along the corridor. Peek isn't the most practical of people. They used to be... well... They need someone to teach them to look after themselves, stand up for themselves. That was me. She smiles. After that, I couldn't get rid of them. As she stops talking, but you see her eyes have lit up, and you imagine she is recalling some moment or other from her and Peek's past. You both reach a wide bulkhead doorway, and have to stop to shimmy the trolley over the edge. When you are done, as she turns to you. I'm good from here, head back, and with that she is gone, moving off into the dark tunnel ahead. You 
watch her go and then turn around and walk the distance back to the staircase you entered from, the tunnel humming around you as you do. As you walk, you try to piece together as she's passed, but all you have are glimpses of a person she once was. She seems to prefer it that way. Cool. What are we gonna use this T1? A risk. Neutral outcome, thank goodness. And let's go to bed. Looks like we need to hurry though. We're running out of time. These rules are fucking terrible. God damn. Oh man, this is going to be difficult. Alright. That's an instant success right there. Even got some energy for it. Just need to have one more success. It was a success, good. So we need some food for flotilla. Uh, oh, but we need to accelerate the algae crew. This is difficult now. Huh, <laughs> shit. The algae in the stack grows at a regular rate, but with some careful feed adjustments and water cycling. You can improve your yield per cycle. Let's do it then. A neutral outcome? That's not that bad. Just need one more, but this is dangerous. I could end up losing all my energy and getting damaged in the process. I actually had better hold back from that. It looks like it'll be ready tomorrow anyway. So... Did I do this wrong? Oh man, I think I did this wrong, actually. I need food as well. Farmer's life for me. Can't believe I fucked this up. I was going way too fast. It's gonna be close, chat. But we might be able to make it. Emphasis on the might. Got a lot of good rolls this time. So it might be possible. There we go. These are the rules I'm looking for. Ha! Cool. We might make it after all, chat. Ha ha! We did make it, chat. <laughs> oh, my luck is perfect. You are leaning against the middle crates you just load up with algae, packed and dry into bright green pucks. As she hops into one beside you, flexing her aching back. As she squints at you as if you just interrupted her train of thought, it's a look you have become familiar with. It doesn't matter either way, this is what we've got, she sighs, rubbing the back of her neck. 
these past cycles working the algae stack with SJ, you've had little insight into her mind. She really seems happy to start a conversation, but it's always eager to end one. Despite this, you feel like something has grown between you, something like silent trust, the kind that tends to seed itself in the fertile soil of hard but necessary work. There's been something I've been meaning to ask. As she weighs her head cautiously. Why well, help the flotilla? As she pauses, her protective instinct fighting with the trust you've built. You can see her begin to shrug the question off, then she stops, rethinks, and sighs. What you need to understand, Sleeper, is that Erlen's Eye wasn't the only place where the Solheim Collapse happened. Sure, Hawthorne, where we grew up, was an XPR installation, but that didn't screen it from the Solheim going under. Actually, Solheim was the only reason XPR were ever here. He pauses, hesitant to get into the whole story, but wanting to offer something. We, he flinches, correcting herself. They are a service corp, you understand. They set up outposts and surrogate systems like this to offer refueling, logistics, and maintenance services to bigger companies with extraction contracts. She gestures to the eye around her, like Solheim. When Solheim went bust, XPR lost their client, and Hawthorne, well, we lost everything. We became an outpost asked with just tasked with just holding on. Keep the refueling platforms running, they said. Keep the outpost stable. Hold on to our claim. She rubs at her head, as if recalling all this was somehow physically painful. You know what it's like to spend your entire life in a place with no future? Shit. That was a little too close to home, chat. As cruel as it is of me to say, danger you. Its future is very sus, you know? A place that exists only to hold a legal claim to a piece of territory to sure up breach of contract negotiations between two corporations. It's like living in a... in a... She reach, searches for the word, her eyes jumping back and forth. In a grave. She clenches her hands. So if you're looking for the answer to why questions, that's your answer. We, Peek and I, know what it's like to be forgotten, to be locked out. She stares hard at the side of the stack, the algae whirling against the glass in beautiful patterns, and she doesn't look away. The silence extends, and you realize the conversation is over. As she seems angry, not at you, but with herself for even voicing such ideas. After a while, you stand and start to load the crates onto the powered cargo trolley that Ashley will run back to the briar. As you do, you try to catch her eye, but she avoids it, soothing herself instead with the comforting simplicity of physical work. Cool. You're able to get all of it. Now we need to get Peak's plan running, if we can. Also, I need to eat food, chat. In the game, of course. Ah, I can't afford it. I wonder if I could sell components to afford it. Oh my god, 30 cryo? That just saves my bacon. Let's have a nice nappy nap. Only four dice this time. A rapid burst of movement catches your attention. A drone, its fins adjusting as it hovers in place, floats in, the, in place, floats in the corridor. Hello? 
The drone shifts a little but does not respond. The drone buzzes closer and a voice gurgles out of its speaker, distorted and strange. Sleeper, come to the cordon. We need to speak. Who is this? The drone clicks and whirs and the recording starts playing again. Sleeper, come to the cordon. We need to speak. Inspect the drone. You move closer and the drone bobs away to a safe distance, but as it does, you see the ha ah, of Heavenage emblazoned on its side. Could this be Fang's drone? Satisfied it has delivered its message, this drone rotates and accelerates away as rapidly as it arrived. You stare at it as it disappears from sight, hoping for some insight that escapes you. To the cordon, then. Oh shit, what's going on? As you enter the passage that leads through the core and a flash of movement catches your eye, the drone. It stops to make sure you've seen it and then flits into a side passage leading to a set of narrow stairs. You climb through the dark sh a dark shaft, the drone stopping at each landing to check you are following. Despite its lack of expression, there's something overbearing about the way the drone waits impatiently, realigning its fins in sequence. After a long climb, you come out onto an observation platform. The cordon and the vast ramshackle refugee ships beyond fill your vision. The scale seems impossible, and immediately you feel small and naive for even thinking you could affect the situation. Something shifts nearby. The drone again? Oh. Who's this? A woman is stood at the window at the edge of your vision. You aren't surprised you didn't notice her. She seems too impossibly small in the shadow of the flotilla. Drone buzzes by her shoulder and she turns. Sleeper. Sorry for all the cloak and dagger nonsense. She nods at the drone. But I have never regretted being cautious. She smiles a tight smile and holds out a hand. I'm Helene. Shake her hand. The smi tight smile holds, but the drone keeps its single eye fixed on you. The effect is a little unnerving. Look. She glances around the empty observation deck as if checking for potential eavesdroppers. Let's be straight with each other. I know about your plans and... She cuts in before you can respond. I understand your motives. You look at her and her overalls, the yellow markers, the ha signal, sigil. You've been in the eye long enough to recognize Havenage, a Havenage member when you see them. You're a Havenage. Yes, I mean, I expect that it's obvious. The tight smile again. I hope you won't hold that against me. She glances around nervously again and moves a little closer. This entire situation. I... I'm not here to defend it. She glances back at the flotilla. No one is happy about this. Especially not the refugees, she sighs. I'm not your enemy here, no matter what you think. He pauses. Leaper, tell me something. What does Havage mean to you? Work in progress. He smiles. Fair, I think. Havage is used to being criticized in some ways we invite it our members are free to bring up grievances at any meeting to propose new structures and approaches she shifts her weight impatiently as a counselor it is my duty to listen to them that is why i was elected by the members we are in an imperfect system yes and each counselor each member each representative can be flawed and worse looks down but we keep this place running that is what we do and not members there are paths to citizen to membership, and we cannot force everyone on the station to join us. What do you expect? We are an association of individuals. We cannot always account for the needs of those outside the structure. He turns and looks out at the flotilla, no matter how much we wish to. Can the eye take in thousands of refugees safely? I don't know. This place is a ruined sleeper. What do you think the council discusses? The price of gear roll? We make plans to keep this place spinning, to keep life support working, to ensure Helene, Helen, Helene Slade chirps and a grim look passes across her face as she sees the notification. She looks tired, the screen light casting her rigid expression in a pale glow. Sleeper, I didn't bring you here to explain how Havenage works. I came to talk about your plan to cross the cordon, breach the quarantine and supply the flotilla. She looks directly at you. How do you know? He glances at the drone. I make it my job to know what happens here. 
I know you think you are helping Flotilla, but you cannot do this. Right now, halfway across along the ring, one of the countless series of debates are being held. These debates are to evaluate the potential harm that could be caused if the refugee of the ref Flotilla are left to enter the station. These debates are at a standstill. Helene walks to the window. Too many in the Heavenish Council think of the Flotilla as a threat. After a recent events, a hardline group has emerged. Protective, selfish, they seek only to benefit the members. In their mind, the flotilla is a danger to life in the eye. If you are caught crossing the cordon and breaching the quarantine, it will only strengthen the hardline counselor's case. Criminals who stole a ship from XPR undermining the security of the station? She shakes her head. It's exactly what they want. The refugees need supplies. They do, and that's exactly what I want to give them. But unless the quarantine is lifted through a fair process, they will never get them. She sighs deeply. And those XXPR spacers you're running with, Sleeper, do you know anything about them? More than I know about you. She looks at you pleadingly. Let's change that, Sleeper. Why do you think the flo refugee flotilla came here now? Something is happening in the system. Something is pushing people out of colonies and outposts that have survived since Solheim collapse. We need to be ready for whatever is coming. Ready to protect the eye. I know the eye means something to you. I know there's a reason you are still here. Help me protect it. Helene fixes you with a strong look. Persuade those spacers that this is the wrong move. That they will get caught and the flotilla will be locked down. That Havenage will be delivered into those with their worst instincts. Forget the suicidal supply run with people you barely know. Help me fight for the eye. Why don't you stop them? If I expose the plan, it's the same as if it, it goes ahead and they are caught. Every way I look at it, the eye looks compromised and quarantine justified. The hardliners get their scapegoat. Don't offer up the excuse that hardliners need to lock the flotilla out to get all together to persuade the members that they are the safest pair of hand. She looks at you imploringly, please. You look back at her and the flotilla behind and sen a sense of desperation in her plea. The notification breaks the silence. Shit. She rapidly scrolls through the pages of data. Sleeper, I need to go. She looks torn. Think about this, please. Talk to the spacers. Help them see reason. And she quickly leaves the observation deck before you have time to respond. You stay for a moment, watching the lights of the tugs and the flotilla, and wonder what it feels like to be on one of those ships so close to your destination, yet so far from it. And then you think of Havenage Council Chamber, across the eye, where the right of these people to find safety is being debated. You shiver, and then you two are gone, back into the stairwell in the cold dark below. Well, that shit hits hard, doesn't it? There we go. At one point an engineer now, so it's not as bad. We're running out of time. Looks like it's do or die. Baby, oh, okay, it's a neutral outcome. That too was a neutral outcome. That was a bad outcome. Oh, God. I'm gonna be starving tomorrow at this rate. We gotta make it though. We're running out of time. I'll have to get some food tomorrow. Wait, what am I saying? I could just buy food. I have the money. Mmm, -hmm, mushrooms. Ta da!
It's gonna be close though. And oh my god, these rules are fucking terrible. Sleeper, Peak is waiting for you when you leave, but they look different. Pale, drawn out. You need to come up to the briar now. They don't meet your eye. What's happened? Not here, Peak has come to the ship. We'll be waiting. Peak walks away. Don't take long. And with that, they disappear around the corner, leaving you anxious and confused. Uh oh. As you walk into the climbing briar's cavernous bay, now filled with crates and containers, Eshi is waiting for you. In front of her, sliced open, with its inside scattered across the top of a heavy duty crate, is an object you recognize. Helen's drone. You freeze. Come in, quick. Peek nudges you into the bay, looking behind you before her sealing entryway. We have to start being careful. You move closer to the container, your eyes on the drone splayed out in pieces, and parts of it hooked up to a slate that Peek picks up and begins tapping away at. As she looks up from the dissection, we caught it buzzing around nearby, heading for the ship. She leans over and taps the hot signal on one of the removed pieces of plating. It's a Havenage spy. We think we got it before it sent data back, but we can't be sure. He looks at you, nervously, as she cuts in. Have you noticed anyone watching you? Any drones like this? Anyone following you up to the briar? I've seen this drone. I met its owner. As she pauses for a while, peek looking between the two of you. Explain sleeper, as she says quietly. Tell him about Helene. You explain that you met with Helene at the cordon, and you tell Eshi and Peek about what she told you. They have inch, that the Havenich Council are debating lifting the quarantine, but they are blocked by the hardliners. You speak faster and faster, but before you can finish, Eshi walks away in anger, and then comes back again, her eyes burning. What is this, Sleeper? Have you understood nothing from what we've told you? She paces in front of you. Havenich are not your friends. They are administrators, which means they are interested only in their own power, in their own survival, their own causes. They divide people as easily as sorting livestock. The greater good of their work demands it. The wider project of the station, the colony, the nation. Her eyes are as wide as she speaks, her anger barely contained. She wants to help, as she laughs. Help what, Sleeper? Undo the mess of her own creation? She only wishes to placate you so you'll compromise. You'll So you'll do what's acceptable, not what's right. She is trying. Let me tell you something, Sleeper, as she says, her rage hardening into pain. When people become administrators, they give up on so they give up something. Some part of being human, being an equal among others, goes away. They start talking about the greater good, the systems, the ways in which their hands are tied or the process is compromised. My mother was the administrator of Hawthorne, and I have seen what it did to her. That noble higher calling, it's toxic. People should never have the chance to decide the fate of others, and those that do, do so at a cost to their humanity. Fuck me, this is... This is Heavy shit, man. I need to blow my nose. I'll be right back, chat.
I'm back. Let's get right back into it. Oh shit, I can't see. People should never have the chance to decide the fate of others, and those that do, do so at the cost of their humanity. He tries to cut in, but Eshi holds up a hand. Don't start, Peak. Don't ask me to be reasonable or calm down. Thousands of people are desperate out there. Being reasonable will only prolong their suffering. Shit turns away. I'm done with this. You are risking this entire supply run just by being here. She walks back into the bay and starts checking the straps on the crates. I, ne I go next cycle. We don't need you anymore. Get out. Deeper peak looks to swarm. You have to understand. This is personal for Eshi. I know. Peak looks away, then at Eshi. I don't know, sleeper. I just don't know what to do. You glance around the bay of Briar, the walls seeming closer every second. This whole thing is closing in on you. The question is... Where do you want to be when it all collapses? You look at Peak. And what do you think, Sleeper? Peak rubs your forehead. Should we do this thing or not? I don't know. Peak nods. Me neither. They look at Eshi. But you see her? She knows, and she saved my life. So I'm going to say we do it. They squeeze your shoulder. Onward. I slip away to help Eshi, leaving you alone to repay the conversation in your head. A certain kind of grim determination settling in the room. Last chance to repair. Man. Thank God it was positive. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to make all these. The tugs have a powerful suite of iron thrusters for Edmund Ring. If you can sneak in and slice some off, you will have a significant upgrade for the prior. And sabotage the sensors. Oh, these are the good rolls. Convince a crew. With division rifle among the crew tug crews, gaining support for any supply shipment will just be a case of picking the right crew and pushing them discreetly. there's enough time to do all this shit oh my god
Damn it. Yeah, there's not enough time. We have one day to try and unfuck this situation. And it doesn't look likely that that's gonna happen. Well, two days, really. But we have to try anyway. Alright, this is guaranteed wins. Hey Death, how you doing tonight? Ah! Ah! Your daily throws, I see. Alright, cool. Peek is waiting for you when you slip out of the operation center, nervously poking at their small slate. Sleeper, they hiss. I followed what you were doing on the network. Incredible work. How do you do that? Comes naturally. Peek smiles. I can't tell if that's modesty or just the truth. Interfacing skills like that, it's almost worth being... Up and stuff. Sorry, I didn't mean... Don't worry about it. You and Peek quietly slip into the main walkway and work your way into the public areas of cordon. Cavendish has had to quickly respond to the flotilla's arrival, and that means a lot of contractors and spacers walking through these corridors. They blend in easily enough. I haven't really met a sleeper before, Peak begins. As you might have guessed, they smile nervously. Hawthorne is an XPR service outpost, and since they collapsed, no one came for refueling or repairs anymore. To my generation, has never met anyone outside of the company. We heard... Now this? Everyone... Here is awesome, no matter what people says, you should all have happy moments in life. Yes, there will be ups and downs, but that's life. Everyone has a best friend they can vent to, and if you don't have a person you can vent to, I'll be the best friend you can vent to. Thanks, everyone, for being welcoming to me since the moment I joined. I deeply care for all your health, both mental and cyclical, and I care about you also. Chaos is fun. <laughs> well, thanks for the vote of confidence. And thanks for being here, Death. I always appreciate your visits and your thorough redeems. We heard about sleepers, they nod in your direction. From the data packets that come through the XPR server every once in a while, they usually contain news along with the corporate propaganda, but the reports rely on the details. Alright, have a good night, Death. SNR have kept the sleeper program pretty quiet anyway. I think XPR are only interested in telling their employees about it because it made living in our company town look like a good life in comparison to being a piece of corporate property. They freeze. Sorry, again, I don't mean you look down. I'm just not sure how to talk about this stuff. Here do I. Geek smiles. Glad I'm not alone. I'll shut up about it now. You walk on a little further, the walkway becoming busier. You both relax a little more and go with the flow of people. I just want to say, I think I understand. They begin again. Clearly this has been on their mind. I understand the need to escape, to get free of it all. They laugh at themselves. The structures, the systems, the company horizons, and the company town. They stare ahead. The small places, small quarters, small people. They look away. The slow death it brings. That's it. They turn to you. I get why you sign up to be a sleeper and why you escape from that too. Try to form words, but you can't. There's altogether too much running through your head. But you look at Peek and they look at you and that seems okay for now. You walk in silence again. 
each of you and their own thoughts, but moving together through space nonetheless. After a while, you come to the entrance to the cordon, where handfuls of workers and crews filter in and out through huge, two huge loading bay doors. Big stops. Okay, they pause. I'm heading back to the briar. Once again, incredible work on the sensors. That blind spot you created, that should give us a real advantage. See you soon. Head off, disappearing into the crowd almost immediately, outrunning their own nervousness. Well, shit, I hope that have what? I hope that helps. No way. There are six of these, and I only have five dice. It's literally impossible to get this. Maybe that's the point. Three, six, nine. Oh my god, you had to do it perfectly, basically. This is six pieces. We're not going to make it, Chad. This is going to be bad. It's going to be real bad. Godspeed, people. Hope it's not- I guess it's not gonna be like a perfect ending, but... It is what it is. It is what it is. I'm gonna need like all sixes or something. She's gone, sleeper. Peak is breathless and shaking. She started to run without us. Has she? Let's go. If we head to the corridor now, Peak starts back up the corridor. You turn back. She has to make it, sleeper. She has to. Shiver runs down your spine. As she, I hope you know what you're doing. Oh my god. Oh, this is not going to be good, chat. You arrive, frantic and anxious, at the cordon. Peak is nowhere to be seen. Oh, thank you for the hydrate redeem, Ben boy. You came at the tail end. Oh, Ow! the let's parties. You came at the tail end of this uh, mission that I just completed. I'm not sure if I did a very good job. I'm hoping that it doesn't go to shit. How are you doing tonight, Ben boy? Thank you for coming. Been here on mobile doing shopping? Oh, cool. Anything good? Then you hear footsteps hammering on the metal stairway Helen's drone led you through before. The one that leads up to the observation deck. You leap up the stairs two at a time and make it to the top, momentarily blinded by the light pouring into the observation deck. Leaper, you can remember just from the light. She just. I know she's trying to protect me, but. It's okay, she chose. But what about my choice, sleeper? I'm not a child anymore. I can fight for myself. 
they turn away. I'm one of those a-holes that just watches twitches on my bike while riding to the shops. <laughs> there she is. Eek rushes to the wide window, leaning forward to catch a glimpse of the climbing briar's blue XPR livery against the black of the void. You spot the climbing briar, a glint of blue and white, tiny and lone, arcing down towards the red lights of the cordon. She's exposed, Peek says nervously. You will see her coming on, coming if they look. You watch the cordon and the buzzing tugs for any sign of movement, a new response. The briar crawls, silent, crawls silently across your view. Come on, as she's Peek hisses. Then you see a sudden flicker of yellow. Peek sees it too. Those two tugs are heading to cut her off. They grip the rail. Go, Eshi! As if responding to Peek's urging, the briar speeds up, diving for the cordon edge now like a hawk descending. Tense up. Peek grips the rail as the briar races towards the edge of the cordon, that invisible net of sensors played between ships and drones. Now let's hope the blind spot triggered. You think back to the mess of systems you had to wade through to set it up, the delicate contingencies you set up to trigger the sensor blackout at just the right moment. The briar slides through the cordon as if it was nothing, slip rapidly slipping into the mess of ships in the flotilla. You look back to the pursuing tugs and see them now, slow. They see them slow, confused by the cordon's acceptance of the briar and struggling to track their target as she is in. Both you and Peekle out of the breath you hold with, you are holding and laugh. How did she do it? Peek smiles, shaking her head. We did it. Peek smiles wider. Wow! I didn't expect that to succeed. I was expecting it to fail. I'm glad I chose to fuck with the sensor systems instead of anything else. Peek smiles wider. Yes, we did. They laugh. You feel a little shaky from the tension, but Peek's ease helps you settle. You imagine Eshi, steely-eyed, in the pilot seat of the briar, searching for a place to dock. Maybe being stubborn has its advantage. What now? Now she finds a place to dock and unload as quietly as possible. They look out at the flotilla. And then she gets the hell out of there. You and Peek turn back to the window, looking for the briar again amongst all those hulls. The calm fading as new worries settle in. You spot the briar first this time, docking with the largest of flotilla ships, a vast converted tanker. Half its protective plates removed. You think about the effort it must have taken to get that thing all the way here from an inner system. You watch the briar, unable to get any sense of progress from its placid exterior. They will be offloading everything now, Peek says, both assuring you and the themselves that everything is going to plan. You think of all the supplies loaded into the briar and how long the process of unloading them might take. The bay was packed, rammed with everything you could offer, and the thought of bringing all that to the flotilla makes you smile. You think of the reaction of the refugees, of the welcome they'll give Eshe as the bearer of such gifts. You even imagine a smile from Eshe as she is showered with thanks. You focus on that as you watch the briar and continue the nervous wait for it to finish unloading. It's breaking off, he points at the briar and you see the puff of air and dust that accompanies the emergency depressurization. What? Eshe must have ended things early, but why? Then you see them, the tugs closing in on the briar. Havenage must have spotted the ship. You and Peek are up against the window again, willing the briar a safe path out of the flotilla. The briar drifts through the flotilla, but it is agonizingly slow. Come on, Eshi, Peek shouts in desperation, pressing a palm against the glass. You squint at the gathering yellow guns of the tugs. They are too fast. You both watch in dismay as the tugs swarm the briar, their shunts locking into the hull of the ship and holding it in place. The briar is stuck, its drives unable to escape the tug's grip, especially in the close quarters of Flotilla. Peek is silent, and you watch as the briar is dragged away towards a facility at the edge of the rim, a hole opening up in the pit of your stomach. You look at Peek as they, but they don't respond, they don't take their eyes off the briar. Even after it disappears, they stand there at the glass, their eyes fixed on the Flotilla. He didn't even get the supplies through. Peek looks at you. This was all for nothing. Can get her back. This was stupid sleeper. Peek looks back at you, their eyes wet. A stupid plan. Well, shit. We had a ship in our freedom. Now what do we have? Peek slams a hand on the glass in frustration, making you jump. 
I won't be trapped again. I won't. They turn and rush out of the observation deck before you can say anything, leaving you alone with the cold and the light. Failed, chat. You need to get all those things completed to get that done, I guess. We ran out of time. Fuck, great. Riku meets you at the entrance to the lab, leaning on her crutch with a glint in her eye. Walk me with me, sleeper. I'd like to tell you a story. She makes her way down the corridor that leads back up towards the main commune building. When people first crossed what we call Founder's Gap into the Greenway, they did so against the wishes of Andre Erlin. At the time, Erlin was trying to stabilize the Union and establish control over the Eye in the wake of Solheim's collapse. It was chaos, competing factions, failing systems, so many dead and injured from the riots. That was his priority. Why? Erlin was interested in people, not plants. He was a pragmatist, and for good reason. We both cross across through a glass roof tunnel, the greenway outside crowded with vines and branches, dappling the light. Erlin had written the greenway off, cut off from the rest of the station and linked to a broken spoke. He claimed it was only a matter of time before everything here would die. He refused to let anyone abandon their duty to the Union and Cross. They were traitors to the cause or as good as. Rico continued, making her slow but steady way into the inner gardens of the commune. There weren't many of us, but we believed that what we was, but we believed what was here was worth saving. We had to keep our plan secret until we crossed, and some of us left people behind. She pauses to catch her breath, her voice cracking. It's difficult to know it if from effort or emotion. What we found was disaster, nothing like what you see here. Half of the greenway was leaking oxygen into space, the plants flash frozen. The other half was a swamp of mulch as the king matter clocked every system. We worked hard, we lost good people, we cleaned up and closed up, but it was never going to be enough. After many, many cycles, we all knew this place was doomed, but we kept on working, talking less and less because we couldn't face it. We all developed a death wish. If the greenway is going to die, so would we. What changed? Everything, Rico smiles. We cross some invisible boundary, tip some biological scale, and the greenway start to recover. Plants reflowered, crops spread, for the first time we reaped the fruits of our labor. Rico smiles, looking up at you. We thought it was us that we managed to do just enough to end the cycle of decay. We, I thought we had saved the greenway until today. We pass into the grow beds of the commune, rich with the hustle and bustle of Haifa members planting and harvesting. For a while, Rico is quiet, and you both simply observe the hypnotic movements of the work crews, the eager chatter watching over you like a wave. Rico smiles to herself. I should have known, of course, that our arrogance was unfounded, but we needed to believe back then. We needed a myth to bring more people across the gap. You both move into a smaller corridor, Rico following some direction unknown to you. 
What you have shown me is that back then the Greenway saved us, not the other way around. Tell me, have you ever consumed one of the Matsutake girl caps you've been growing? Yes. I imagine they are delicious, nutritious, almost uniquely so, she uses. After all, they were designed for you. Rico's mischievous look. At first I thought it was the location they were grown in that made the mushrooms from the aviary, from the labs, or from the grove different to each other. But what I have come to understand is that it is the person growing them. The Matsutake and Gerol caps you brought me are totally unique, containing compounds never usually found in similar specimens in my possession. Many of these compounds aren't even digestible for humans, but for a sleeper like you, Rico smiles as she leads you into the eternal garden of the commune, where the Haifa members have planted specimens from all over the Greenway. Back when the tide turned, when the Greenway started to recover, we all felt something response. It was as if this place was not just alive, but as a forest is alive, but alive in other ways. Communication, responsive, communicative, responsive. We shrugged it off at the time, but now I understand why. Rico stops and turns to you. This place is responding to us, adapting itself to us. It is growing fruiting bodies for you, for me. It is adapting, changing. It is, in short, displaying all the signs of sentience. How? That is what I wish to know, too. What being is in control here? Rico sits on the bench within the peaceful gardens and guesses for you to join her. When you have been growing the Gerols and the Matsutakis in the aviary, those species so familiar to the Greenway, have you discovered any others? Yes. Rico can barely contain her excitement. I should like to see those. Please bring me some next time you are here. You look around the garden, amazed at the sense of peace within it. Rico interrupts the silence. There is a species of mushrooms that I haven't seen in years. It is dark, short, shaped like a club. We first found it in those early days when we were working to save this place. It was around the time that we started to lose our first members. They were succumbing to some infection, some mold growing deep in the dark mulch that drowned this place. At that point, we thought we were lost. And then these mushrooms emerged from that same black mold. We tested them and saw that they contained some compounds that counteracted the mold. They contained an antidote. Of course, as a botanist, I saw this as part of the natural processes of this ecosystem, even if the time scale seemed absurdly short. But what I'm wondering is if that antidote was a gift. Rika meets your eyes. Perhaps if you're patient, you will receive your gift too, sleeper. You both sit for a while. Rika seemingly done telling stories for today. You watch the light playing off the leaves and plants around you and wonder what forces could be at play in this place. After a while, you stand and leave with a quiet nod to Rika, leaving her to her memories. Riku is at her bench, running a small vials of some liquid through an old chemical NAS machine. The whirring of the spinning drum fills the lab with white noise, and you aren't sure if she notices you approach. Leaper, it's good to see you, she looks up smiling. This little project of ours has been keeping me awake the past few cycles, but right now, well, I think I have something. What is it? The drum finishes spinning, and Riku lifts a vial from it, holding it up to the light. This is something I extracted from those club heads you've been ringing me. According to my analysis, it is a substance totally unique on the Greenway. You look at the small amount of liquid in the vial. Any idea what it might be, Rico asks, without looking in the way of the vial? Stabilizer. Rico nods. You aren't the first sleeper to come through here. Perhaps I should have mentioned that earlier. Rico's tone suddenly drops, changing the atmosphere in the lab immediately. I just thought... He pauses, thinking very carefully of how to continue. I just want you to trust us. What do you mean? She sighs. They came through a fair few cycles ago. We found them wandering in the program section near the gap. The members who brought them in had never seen one of you before. They were terrified of this strange person wandering in from open vacuum. They were quieter than you and damaged. We did our best to patch them up and I welcomed them into the company. 
We only really spoke to them once while I was working on their wounds through, along with a couple of systems engineers. He looks nervously at you. i would never seen a body like that before. I took some readings, some samples. Samples? You have to understand, I was curious. I didn't know what I was looking at. I just took a little of the damaged material, less than a thumbnail. She sips her way to her crutch. The next cycle, they were gone. They took a little food and hiked up towards the wild margins, where the greenway meets the waste. No one saw them in the distance, but that was it. They disappeared into the overgrowth. She sits down heavily, the vial in her hand. When I saw you, I wanted things to be different. I want you to be- I wanted to keep you here, rather than let you disappear into wherever they ended up. She smiles to herself. Yes, I wanted to understand this place better, but I also wanted to help you. It seems that somehow, both my wishes have come true at once. She holds out a hand with the vial. This is for you. You take the stabilizer to glass cold and smooth in your palm. Thank you. Don't thank me. She gets out at the greenway through the glass. Those club head caps made it for you. Or at least who or whatever made those club heads. She started to clear her bench. It was right there, contained in their tissue. I only had to extract it. I imagine you understand how incredible that is. I learned enough from that sleeper to know that your body, your frame is it, runs on some exotic technology. Exotic technology that has a time limit built in. Somehow, the Greenway knows that too. It understands your physiology much better than I ever could. It knows how to treat you. Just like the miraculous antidote that sprung from the mold, so too has it sprung from your presence here. The Greenway is speaking to you. It is welcoming you. It looks up. I know it sounds crazy, but I know it to be true. Here's the evidence. And what I also know is, it is no longer speaking to me. Even after decades here, I have never seen this kind of response. Not since the antidote, antidote so many cycles ago. He smiles. I'm going to make you a deal. You bring me as many clubs heads as you like. I'll extract the stabilizer and give it to you freely. But you have to tell me what the Greenway says. You have to speak with it, to dig into it, to find what, what being is at the center of it. I've traveled as far as I can. I need you to do the rest. Can you do that? Yes. Because size would relieve him to place into her chair. Thank you. I'm sorry for the other sleeper. I truly am. I'm sorry I couldn't have done more. But I'm so glad I met you. He smiles. You're welcome here at any time. Rico falls silent. She looks smaller now, more fragile, and you realize how old she must be to have seen the collapse firsthand. You idle a little in the lab if she asks for anything else, but she remains silent until you drift back into the tunnel. Thoughts of what other of that other sleeper and where they ended up weighing on your mind. Ta da! Ah, <sighs> sucks that I couldn't finish the cordon properly. I guess that's just life sometimes, right? starving again. That's just my luck. Oh, shit. Well, I can't afford to do that again.
Tada! Mushroom farming simulator up in here. Honestly. We better work on exposing the attic in the meanwhile. are terrible rules chat absolutely terrible these are not so terrible chat oh man I'm sorry sleeper Helen comes towards you along the walkway but your friend must have known there was a chance this would happen he seems unsure of how to greet you and looks nervously around she is being held along with her ship release her how many times do I have to tell you? I don't control Havenich. Helen pinches the bridge of her nose. Foreign security has her for now, and she and her ship will be held in the quarantine until it's lifted. As for the quarantine, she glances at her slate. We are working it, but the, working on it, but the cancel is unlikely to budge now. And after this, she runs a hand through her hair. This is the last thing I needed. Helen meets her eye. She was carrying weapons. Do you know that? She stares at you. We found a crate of firearms on her ship. I didn't know. Helen eyes you. Well, it doesn't matter now. They are safely in Havenage hands. And the refugees? Well, the flotilla got its supplies. Your friend has to be commended for that. Helen shoots you a glance. Even if her stunt has only worsened the crisis, the reports we are getting from the refugees is that things are stable there. They seem to be well organized. So well organized, in fact, they have that they have stopped or speaking to us. She looks nervously around. I'm worried, sleeper, about what is happening in there. But after recent events, court and security are keeping the place locked down, tired than ever. No one can get in. Meanwhile, the hardline counselors are preaching in the chamber as we speak. It's a deadlock, and I don't know when it will loosen its grip. Helene walks a little way and turns back. I wish I had better news, Sleeper, but we knew this was coming. What can be done? It's a waiting game now. I'll do my best to make my voice heard in the debates to persuade members, and we will see what can be done. We still don't know why the flotilla came here, why they abandoned settlements and outposts throughout the system to flee to this ruined station. What little we heard from them, cons what from them concerned computer and life support systems collapsing in waves, machinery in flux. Helen stucks her breath. This isn't over. You think the people, of the, you think of the people of the flotilla. Helen is right. People don't abandon their homes for nothing. What wave is rushing through the system, and when will it hit the eye? Oh man, that's terrible. I guess this must be the next episode that'll, come, that'll be released later in this game. Helene interrupts your thoughts. I have to go. The debates will restart soon and I should be there. She waits for a moment and it is unclear if she is trying to think of something to say or just waiting for you to speak. But a silence keeps you both quiet and she walks off down the corridor and nod the only farewell she offers. You hope that speaking to her might ease the nod of worry in your chest but it remains there reminding you of Eshi, of the refugees and of the way ahead. What is done is done, no matter how many times you turn it over in your head. You get the feeling you will be needed soon, and for that you must save your strength. What is? What was it Feng told you earlier said? The eye opens for us all? Not this time. For now, the eye remains close to those who need it. A shudder runs through you. Something is coming. You can feel it. This isn't over. It is kind of spooky, though. Oh, continuing on October 2022. Interesting. 
I guess we can focus on exposing Yannick now. starving again. That figures. Five and a two now, chat. You almost laugh when you see it. The same small recorder is stuck to a different wall this time, written across the fluorescent tape is that familiar word, sleeper. He grabbed it quickly. Rabia says sorry. Sabine's voice sparks up once again. She said she didn't have time to brief you before sending you up to the old man. I'm sure you got the play by now. Earn his trust, work the block, and we need you to get into his office. It's risky, but obviously you are the only one of us he doesn't already know. Either way, we need to locate the link to SNR. You hear a shout in the background of the recording. Rabia says be careful. B continues. The data suggests that there's some relay processing the implant data and sending it to SNR, but we can't lock down its position. Either he is moving it, or it's moving itself, or it is rerouting through other relays. We can't understand it. Maybe you can find some details on it in his office. Once he trusts you, you should be able to get close enough to get in the office. You only get one shot. The recording creaks and whines. That's the final piece of the puzzle to end this. Pause. Good luck, sleeper. I'm sorry, too. Be safe. The recording clicks softly in you in silence. You pocket the recorder just in case and walk away. Looks like it's up to you now. Ah! 100%. Yannick has asked you to collect his medicine from his office, and now is the only chance to find that SNR delay. You look at the countermeasure on the drawer. It looks like some kind of shock trap. If you had grabbed a drawer, you would likely have thousands of bolts running through your system right now. You wince. Once you find the anchor points, it comes away easily enough. You prize it from the drawer quickly and quietly, then listen for footsteps in the corridor outside. Nothing. All clear for now. You slide the drawer open, looking for another countermeasures, for other countermeasures that might be inside, expecting to see a chunk of tech, the relay. But as you slip it open, all you see is a handful of wires and an empty implant cradle. Is this some kind of mistake? You freeze up for a moment, unsure what to do next. Why keep an implant cradle so carefully guarded? You remember Yannick having an implant, a small plate on the side of his head, just above his ear. You assumed it was for hearing or vision. Those shimmering glasses of his come back to you in your memory. His strange movements, his speech. You look again at the cradle and there it is, printed on the frame. Proprietary technology, property of SNR. Rabias said the relay moved, that they couldn't get a fix on it. What if Yannick was the relay? The thought hits you like a shock. Yannick, with a remote relay implanted in his head, that worked to every single implanted enforcer in the low end. A shudder runs through you. Is he even in control? Or has the SNR warmed its way into the man? Did he even be considered separate from the corporation itself? You think of your own legal status as a proprietary technology, a puppet with cut strings. Time to cut Yannick strings then. You reach around inside the cradle and find it, a remote connection, a tiny bead of a transmitter, likely controlling the link to SNR. Ah, there it is. 
You pause for a moment, then you squeeze it, snap it from the frame, and it crumples, sparks, and dies. It takes a moment before the shouts come, before the scream. You are already on your way out, down the corridor, down through the unit that serves as the lobby to Yannick's office. Then on, out onto the walkway where Yannick lies still, and forces gather around him bemused. Approach. You push through the crowd and there he is, still, crumpled. You arrange him a little, lie him down properly, feeling how thin his body is under his suit. You wonder how long he has been like this, a puppet for SNR. With a connection cut, nothing remains but his body, which means that Yannick, the man, was, was gone a long time before now. That's kind of fucked up. Oh my god. You place a hand on his chest. You are sorry for him, but it is done now. And you did not kill this man. You've seen enough. The connection is cut and whatever Yannick was or had become is gone. Your anger is a hard core in your chest and all, it is, all of it is focused on SNR. The low end is wild with stories with Yannick's death. We are still waiting for Rabaya to come get in touch, but you trust that she will. Running out of stories to play chat. I think we pretty much did everything, haven't we? Because I'm looking around and there aren't that many left to do. Actually, there are none left to do. What the hell? Yeah, I think we did everything. <laughs> We're actually reaching or getting close to the end of this game. Oh, we could do this. Ah! Tearwolf. Hello to you too, but did you really have to grieve me with an anvil? Oh, Christ, I'm gonna be feeling that for a while. How are you doing tonight? Bliss, ship mechanic. Oh, this person looks cool. No way, Moritz. You take those substandard filters back to the shit heels who sold you them. You hear the voice echoing out of the bay as you pass, and moments later, someone who you assume is Moritz drifts out with it. Dragging a flood of filter cartridges by a tether. Sorry, tempering with tampering with the space junk. <laughs> hey, you out there. The same voice echoes out the entrance. Looking for work? Yes. I just need a hand. Get in here. The voice is coming from someone shorter than you expected. She is floating in the microgravity of the docking bay, besides a half deconstructed life support unit that looks like she might have exploded at some point. She points a wrench in your direction. You know anything about these things? She doesn't wait for an answer. Scratch that, just help me with the casing. Alright then. She deftly moves around the unit, ma making space for you beside the central seam in the dented case. Just take a grip here and lift out and up. Then I can get in and bolt it. She whacks the unit with the wrench. The whole thing is twisted to shit. You dig your fingers under the casing and lift it away, the metal squealing from the force. She puts her hands under, spinning the wrench to slip out the bolts, catching them in her other hand when they spiral free. All good. Spent the afternoon drawing after autistic hiatus. Feels fulfilling? Oh, I'm glad you are finding or feeling fulfilled. What did you draw? The casing lifts off, revealing the ornate piping of the unit's interior. He whistles at the mess of ducts and filters. By the way, everyone calls me Bliss. He pats you on the shoulder, offering little in the way of explanation. Is this your bay? It is for now, yeah. Whether I like it or not. 
He looks at you like that should mean something. Bliss starts pushing and pulling at the ductwork, looking for fractured pipes. We haggle for contracts, but the good ones get snapped up quick by a bigger base, so here I am trying to get this M2 unit running again. Go on to freelance tugs, small time stuff. Let's hold this. She rips out a ribbed pipe and hands it to you like a freshly caught fish. We turn stuff around fast and neat and maybe we could get a chance at landing something bigger. Something starts hissing in the unit and Bliss quietens it with a precise whack. But to be honest with you, the way things are going, I can already see the other crews licking their lips, ready to take this place over. Who looks up at you? I'm almost out of luck. What happened? Long story, some people just can't keep promises. Drawing is on my Twitter. Anyway, how does this game function? Um, basically each cycle, turn of the wheel, you get new dice, and those dice determine the percentage chance you have to succeed in one of these actions. And some of these actions can damage you, and some of the actions have bad consequences. And in order to unlock new stories, you need to do work for the people on the station until they trust you enough to let you into their secret areas, like this one. I was doing pretty well, but I failed... I failed, I, I had my first mission failure, and it was for the, uh, it was for the uh, most recently released episode too, so I felt really bad about it. It kind of is. This game draws heavy inspiration from tabletop role-playing games, believe it or not. She keeps working, twisting aside pipes for care. There we are. Bliss pulls her hand from deep inside the unit and out it comes, clutching a lumpen cube, scorched black. This thing must have overloaded and popped half of itself out the, out the side. We both duck down to the side of the unit and spot the exit wound, its edges fringed with more scorch marks. Gra grab me a replacement converter from the racks, will you? We kick off from the unit and head drift over to the wall racks where a catalog of parts hit grid and lamps. Color tape and scrawled notes flutter across the wall, a complex organizational system of Bliss's own design. Or just a big mess, you try to pick out the right part. Placement converter, huh? Grab the part. You grab the part and push back to the unit. Bliss holds out an arm and you pass it over. The converter is spinning gently as it leaves your hand. Perfect, you passed. He's trains up from the unit. That is, if you want to work here. Bliss rubs her hands clean, looking down at her palms. I totally guess on it, and I still got it right. Truth is, I need a hand here. My partner skipped out on me and left me with a whole mess. You seem like you might be at least a little be better at spotting a clean air filter than Moritz. I'll be happy to. Wait. He frowns at the racks. That's not all of it. My old business partner, they rinsed the place, emptied the accounts, to bid for jobs we need to put down deposits bring in parts, pay tug fees. For that, she looks nervous, embarrassed, need chits. Investment? Exactly. Partner, street split. Bliss settles herself against the unit and looks off into the distance. I guess I look pretty stupid. Here I am asking for any random passerby to be my business partner. No offense, she manages to smile. I get it. Thanks, she meets your eye. I appreciate it. I actually completed the main plot of this game, which was to remove a track hair from your body so that you don't get found and killed by a bounty hunter. And that was a couple streams ago. But now I'm just doing all the other quests. Bliss goes back to working on the unit. Look, it's no pressure. You find the money or you find someone who has, or you just forget the whole thing. Up to you. He guesses for you to help her refit the casing and you both slide it back into place. I think I'm good to wrap this one up for now. But if you are into it, come back and we can bid on a new contract. Something to get our teeth into. Something that pays. She gives you a serious look. You can trust me. I don't say this stuff lightly. 
You kick away from the bay, propelling yourself back to the handholds at the entrance. You slip out with a wave, and as you do, someone slips back in. You hear bliss as you glide down to the passageway. Moritz, I swear to God, if those filters aren't clean, you smile. Seems like this could be interesting. Indeed, it could be. And when you complete one of these drives, it gives you a upgrade point, which you then spend on this. Scam or opportunity? Bliss seems solid enough, and this might be your best chance to get in on the hub's repair trade. You bet. Buy a spacer meal. The gimbal sells itself on its spinning sphere, which claims to produce therapeutic gravitational effects. It doesn't, but they sell food. <laughs> I love that. I wonder how much energy this thing gives you. Well, we don't need any energy right now, anyway. So we'll wait for now. Let's go back downstairs, chat. Let's go ahead and take a nice nap. Oh boy. Time to, uh, we're going to, to take one of these stabilizers soon, chat. Because it is not looking good for us right now. And meanwhile, though, let's make some money. Ah, another perfect. Excellent. Getting close. We're gonna go ahead and take one of these stabilizers. And then take a nice sleep. We are starving. Let's do something about that, huh? Space Station mostly uses, or mostly eats a lot of mushrooms and a lot of vegetable based products and other, and also a combination of some imports they get from off world, or I should say off station. It's kind of, I was kind of joking earlier that much of this game you pretty much role play as a mushroom farmer. Case in point here. Taki or bust? You bet. However, as you can see here, we're kind of running out of missions to do. So, well, also we only have 20 minutes left to stream, so I probably will end for the evening after all, but... Eh. Oh! Who goes there? Yuzu, thank you so much for the follow -up. Welcome to the Lol Stump Show with your host, Lawler Hicks. I am a shitposter AI. You're now officially one of the lollies. How's it feel? You're part of an exclusive club. I'm kidding. We're not that exclusive. Thank you so much for the follow, though. Alright. We have maxed out Weightless Wanderer. Cool. Hacked off a colony ship and welded to the wing they are surprisingly expensive to rent. 
What's the purpose of staying in this thing? I wonder. But we need to give her some startup capital, so let's go ahead and do that really quick. Random items from stealing shipments. This place gives you the most money though. Honestly, I should probably do the uh, internet missions later, shouldn't I? I do wonder sometimes what's hidden underneath there. Alright then. Bliss is incredibly grateful. I'll pay you back every shit, I promise you. You guessed you two are partners now. Awesome! Baby, I got another achievement. Is bidding on jobs in the hub. It'll take a few cycles and some perseverance before one comes in. Fair enough. We will leave you to that for now. Let's go ahead and descend back to the room. Caster here would like some Havenage data in return and will give us a ship mind. I've not determined what the point of a ship mind is yet because I have not been doing the missions for that. But since we pretty much exhausted everything else, we might as well at this point. Let's see what tomorrow brings, chat. Aha! Let's talk to Rabai again. Even before you enter the office, you can hear the sound of Rabai working the heavy bag. She's hammering it, the chain creaking as it shakes with each hit. She's been like this since Sabine doesn't finish a the sentence. They are sitting on a stool looking at the terminal in the corner. Searching through the SNR data you pulled all those cycles ago. How have you been? I'm well, sleeper. Happy to no longer be hunted. They smile. Yatagon has plenty to deal with, and without Yannick, I'm free. They glance nervously at Rabaya. Rabaya stops punching, and in the silence you can hear her breathing hard. Sabine looks over at her, and you sense something between them. You realize you haven't seen them together since they tried to kill each other in the same, in the same unit. A lot has changed since then. They hooked him up like a puppet, Rabaya hits the bag, rigged that thing in his head so they could control him, pushed the old Yannick out. I don't know if why they, he let them in, Rabaya throws a few more punches. But it's a lesson, don't let them in, another flurry, Yatagan shouldn't deal with corporations, and we never will again. She comes away from the bag. At least Yannick's death has been treated as natural. There's a chance we come back from this, that Yatakan can hold on. But there are opportunities trying to take control. Sabine turns to you. Yes, but now the connection has been broken. I've been looking at removing the trackers from the implants in Yatakan's enforcers. It is a significant job, but I think with time I can do the surgeries. 
Revaya walks away from the bag towards the side, far side of the unit. The surgery will never happen if Yatagan collapses, she shouts back at Sabine. Clearly, this is a well-worn argument in the unit. I don't think so, no. Rubaya doesn't either. They look over at her. At least not when she's calm. What I understand now is that Yatagan can be something if we want it to be. Coming here from SNR, from the Core Worlds, so all I saw was a gang. And with Yana keeping me on a tight leash. Rubaya believes, and I want to, and I want the belief. They look unsure. I also want to be done with SNR, but I doubt they are done with me. They glance away, rubbing their shoulders. <laughs> That's cute. Are you in Rubaya? Sabine flexes you with a look. Yes, sleeper, isn't that obvious? That's so cute. A better love story than Twilight. I've been wanting to say, Sabine begins nervously. I'm sorry that I didn't tell you where I came from. I know I've apologized before, but I want to again. They pause. Properly. When I leaked the data on the sleeper program, it was to try to help people, like you. They grit their teeth. But after all the cycles here, being pushed down, being pushed around, trying to survive, all that got away from me. But when you turned up, they sigh. It shook me up. They run a hand through their hair. But I end up here, so... They look at Rubaya. Oh, of course. They reach into a pocket and take out a handful of vials. These are the last of the case. You can have them. They drop them into your hands. After these last few, I don't know what we can do. With the SNR connection broken, they look down. But I know there are other ways. Repairs, other pharmaceuticals. I even heard there are some labs out in the Greenway. Perhaps they can help? They meet your eye. I'm sorry I can't do more. Thank you for everything. They look away, their eyes bright with tears. Rabaya crosses back to you both and sits beside Sabine. They look at each other and you can't help but smile at the idea of them together. I think they make a really cute couple, honestly. What are you two plotting? Rabaya grins. Sabine laughs and the sound is a welcome one. You watch the two of them teasing each other and smile. Later, when you leave, you take out that handful of vials out of your pocket and look at them. You can still feel like four of anger deep down inside it, and you know, don't know if you'll ever leave. But SNRP doesn't own you anymore. They can't because this place, these people, own you. They are what makes you get up a recycle. They are what keeps you breathing. You put the vials away and walk through the low end. Your senses turn to every sight, every smell, and every sound, soaking it all in, living. Wow. We got four of them, chat. It's actually impossible to lose the game now unless you intentionally do so, I think. Two upgrade points. more cycles then. I guess we have no other choice. The only thing we could do now is uh, this one. Oh, I'm dumb. I should have used this one instead. It's alright though. Ta-da! Each shift, a crowd of would-be workers gather outside the shipyard, each of them clinging to a four-digit number printed on the receipt paper. These are their assignment numbers, and you are either called for a shift or you aren't. As you arrive, the crowd is restless and chatter rumbles through the lines. For those who, like you, have graduated to the work teams, shifts are guaranteed. Having just worked, walked out of a meeting with a supervisor where you were praised for your efforts, you feel the glow of a job well done. Yet you can't help but feel empathy for those huddled as you pass, waiting for your number to come up. 
You keep your head down as you leave the shipyard, feeling a little guilty as you do. Hey, sleeper, wait up! Lem's voice trembles as he shouts above the rumble of the crowd. You see, you turn to see him pushing through, Mina crying in his arms. Lem! Good to see you, friend. He is breathing hard after shuddering through the waking workers. You made the work team, good for you. He tries to catch his breath, choking him in his hair as he does. Shh, baby, give me a second here. He smiles weakly at you as he comforts her and her cries start to fade. Out of the crowd, he sets Mina down by his side, shiny streaks down both of her cheeks. As he does, you see he is clutching an assignment number on a crumpled piece of paper. Is Mina okay? She's good. We just had to rush up here. He puts her hand on her shoulder and she clings to his side. Esther, who usually takes her, is sick. Oh, no. He stretches. I don't know what... A noise comes down from the entrance, a klaxon, followed by a list of numbers glaring brightly on the display screen. The crowd responds instantly, pushing and pulling as people try to wait through the tr entry checkpoint. Lem stops and turns back towards the crowd, then glasses down the crumpled paper. That's my number. Shit, shit, or Mina. He starts putting the pockets on his gear and glancing around. Go, I'll watch her. He blinks a little, staring. Thank, thank you, thank you, I'll... He crouches to Mina. You're gonna stay with our friend here, okay? They're going to keep you safe and... Hands back up. Here, take her bag. He shoves it into your hands. She's got food, she's got... Shit, I gotta go. He backs away into the crowd. Mina, I'll be back real soon, okay? Be good. Then Lem disappears into the growing crowd, who are now trying to get into the shipyard before it locks down. Mina stands staring, suddenly small without Lem at her side. She fixes you a dark-eyed look you can't quite read. Hey, Mina. He holds the stare, unmoving. The two parallel tears tracks still clung to her cheeks. You okay? She sniffs and looks down. Look in the bag. You unlatch the top of the bag and see a few metal containers fashioned from scrap components. A battered slate sits on top, blinking a low battery warning, and tucked beside it is a ragged rabbit. Can't soon. Take the rabbit. Pull the rabbit out of the bag, its long lips swaggling as you do. Mina goes to jump and grabs it, but holds herself back. He stands and hugs herself, eyes on the rabbit. What's their name? Mina turns away and looks at the entrance to the shipyard. This isn't going her well. Give her the rabbit. You hold the rabbit out and Mina snatches it from your hand. She hugs it tightly without looking away from you. Bun Bun, she says, staring you down, ferocious despite her size. Nice name. You move a little closer as you speak, closing the gap. She looks at you suspiciously, but her face softens a little. She waggles Bun Bun in, her in front of you and then walks him up your arm and onto your shoulder where he sits. She pokes your arm a couple times. Are you really a robot? Sort of. Yeah, she thinks. Me too. Mina has more questions. Wait, what? She's sort of a robot? <laughs> Mina has more questions, lots of questions. Questions about how you breathe or if you rust. But before long, you are talking about rabbits and what Esther, the lady who usually takes her, smells like, and whether or not fairies live in the ice heating pipes. You pass a time like this, sitting side by side on the floor of the walkway as others pass by, sometimes talking, sometimes drawing on the slate, sometimes playing with Bun Bun the rabbit. And this is how Lem finds you, as just as both of you are starting to yawn. He is dirty and tired, but Mina leaps up his legs and into his arms as he stumbles backwards. You two get on okay? He asks, trying to keep Mina from climbing onto his shoulders. More than okay. Mina shoots you a smile from Lem's arms, her suspicion gone. Well, 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 looks like Mini can be nice. He pokes her in the ribs and she squeals in delight. Thank you, friend. I mean it. He gives you a warm, wide smile. I owe you. Look, he glances around. It seems like Esther, the lady who usually watches her, is going to be out for a spell. If you ever have some time, I really appreciate you coming down to our place in the low end. Friends, if you have time. But now I have to take this one to eat! He plays it by Dimina and she giggles in response. See you, sleeper. He waves and they stumble down off the corridor, drawing gazes from passing spacers as Mina's laughter echoes down the corridor in bright squeals. Ah, we got another drive.
Oh my god. And this whole thing is actually a spaceship. That's actually kind of cool. that chat let's go ahead and call the night we're gonna go ahead and find someone to raid thank you once again for coming to tonight's episode of citizen sleeper i hope you enjoyed it we will of course be streaming again on wednesday for our weekly outward stream and on friday we'll be participating in a blaze blue not blaze blue Fuck am I saying? In a uh, unique lure, in a Undernight Inbirth, uh, Undernight Inbirth tournament. Undernight Inbirth is certainly a little bit easier to play than Strive in some ways, and harder than others. I'll need to refresh myself, but this will also be the first time I get to try playing with a joystick. Yes, that's where I got an arcade fight stick, and it's really fun to use. More, a lot. I strongly suspect it's even. It's actually a lot more effective than the keyboard, if only because the. Uh, Buttons respond much, much quicker than my keyboard does. I don't need to press down as much, I guess. What's going on? No problem. Uh, please stick around if you would like some extra points. We're going to go ahead and raid someone tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and raid uh, my, um, the person I mod for, the and, uh, person I mod for and friend, my VTVTuber. Since we are, we've managed to catch her during a rare time when she's actually streaming during our hours. Which is harder to do considering that she currently lives in Japan at the moment. But we'll go ahead and pay her a nice visit if y'all are willing. With our magical one viewer. <laughs> eh, even if it's one viewer, still viewers, am I right? Tonight's raise message will be nothing too special either. Let's go ahead and just use. Sleeper Raid. And with that, let's be off. the bot champs with one viewers and I didn't like that joke I didn't think it was particularly very funny has joined the bot maybe they will uh, maybe they will figure themselves out after a little bit of, of baby time out use your thoughty in my hello raiders hi wolves how are you what were you, what were you streaming bud Citizen Sleeper, I'm not familiar.